Hello everyone and welcome to this video of Thermaculture Opportunities, a project co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program helping businesses in the thermal and gastrotourism build their economic capacity through hiring staff and improving their marketing. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Elita Kostuba. I am the founder of Voca Academy and I have been delivering trainings for organizations and individuals in the past 20 years. I have spent all my career teaching, training, coaching, and consulting. But I'm also a passionate traveler, and I absolutely love some of the places where I have been in terms of spa hotels and restaurants. And although most of the places I have been to are amazing, I cannot stop to notice things that are super easy to change, but are never changed. This is how the idea of the Therm Opportunity Project was born. Today, I will be talking about decision making in business. And while some of you might be thinking, well, decision making in business, come on, what is this? Let me tell you that in most cases, it is precisely the decision making that makes or breaks a business. And while you might be thinking this is not true for tourism, let me convince you in the next few minutes that it is. Regardless of what business yours is, decision making is key. You might be thinking that currently you need resources, money for your marketing or for your expenses. But let me tell you something, those resources will come and will be managed by your decisions. Or you might be thinking that you need staff, you need people, and there are no people you can hire in your local area. There are few young people in your local area or they're underqualified. Again, while this is absolutely true, it is your decisions that will manage this situation and make of it a success or not such a success. I'm sure most of you knows the story. I'm sure most of you know the story of those two iconic companies, Kodak and Nokia. Both companies were big businesses and they both went out of business due to poor decision making. While Kodak was one of the greatest companies in the 20th century, it did fail to innovate. And also it got to uh, some sort of entitlement and belief that they are superb, that there is nothing that can defeat them. And this led to the end of the company. Another example is Nokia. It had great financial resu results, but again, it was not responding to changing environment. What killed those companies were the decisions of the people leading them. They both had opportunities, they both had capacity, but it's decision that killed them. We might be thinking decisions are rational, decision is a rational process, but let me tell you something, decisions are not rational and decision making it's not a rational process. While there have been a view about decision making for a long time called the rational model, it has been challenged since 2013 and onward. The Genko model suggests that the decision making is not as rational as we think it is. It's composed by four stages. Now, while you're listening to this, I want you to think about your own business decisions. Actually, I want you to take a notebook and a pen and write down your past few business decisions. Those might be small decisions like giving a day off to someone when there is little staff or promoting someone when you're not quite sure about it or something as trivial as just making a new order for your restaurant. Please think of some of the decisions that you have made while listening to this information and analyze them through the lenses of this information. Now, let's look at a process which is not so rational, a process of decision making. First stage of the Genko model is filtering and processing information. We'll talk about filtering information later, but what does that mean? It means that we are not computers. What comes as an input 
it's not equal to what comes as an output because what comes as an input is influenced by our emotions, our past experience and our values. Then comes determining the value or meaning of the information we have already filtered. So let's, took, let's take an example of hiring a new staff member which might be underqualified for a local spa hotel. So we have information about this new staff member. She is 19 years old, she has graduated the local high school, she doesn't speak a foreign language, and she's nice, communicative, she has a lot of friends, she's social. So this is the information that we have. And this is not even all of the information, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Now we are going to filter this information. Previously in this spa hotel, there have been many young people, both boys and girls, who have not been excellent employees due to their youth, due to the lack of work ethics of their generation. So we are filtering this information and we already have a bias. We have a bias operating only with the top of the iceberg in terms of information. Now we are going to determine the value or meaning of that information. What does that information mean to me as a business owner and decision maker? It means that no language skills, she won't be able to handle international guests. Young, and now I am making meaning. So she's just like the rest that I've been working with and that have not performed perfectly. Finally, we deliver and analyze the information and then act and behave. Now, this might seem as a rational process, but let me tell you why it is not. It is not because of the filtering part of the information. So if we go back, we see that the first step, the very first step of the decision-making process refers to filtering and processing information. So at step one, we are already prone to bias. This is the NLP model of communication, but it's also the NLP, which stands for neuro-linguistic programming, a science of how we can model our behavior. This is the model of communication, which also has to do with how we interpret and filter information. So on this picture, you see an external event. Now we have our five senses. And the information for this external event comes to our five center senses. And here is where the filtering happens. In our brain, we have these filters which make us to generalize, distort, or delete information. We are never objective. Doctors are not objectives. Scientists are not objective. Mathematicians are not objective. They might be object objective when they're solving a problem or working on a case, but when it comes to decision making, those filters come in place. So we might be generalizing information. Let's look at the example with the girl. We are about to hire a girl, girl and we are generalizing. We're saying she's like the rest. We don't know if she's like the rest, but we're generalizing. We're also deleting some information we might be forgetting that she's very social or we might be forgetting that she had very good grades at school at, in her language and literature classes, which means she might pick up language really fast. And we are also distorting information. If we don't like the way someone looks, we might be biased against that person. So here the filtering happens and then we have our state so when the information comes in, it's filtered, it's either deleted, distorted, or generalized. This creates our state, which means how we feel emotionally. And based on how we feel, we act. There is the behavior. So you see the cycle from the external event, filtering the information, feeling the emotion, and then back to acting or behaving. This is the decision-making process. Is it rational? It is not. And why do we want to challenge the presumption that decision-making is rational? 
because this is the presumption that killed Kodak and Nokia, but this is also something that it's affecting businesses on a daily basis. It's making some business fly and others die. When we have an emotion, it leads to bias and it leads to a decision which is biased. Now, how is this related to the tourism sector? How is the way we make decisions related to decision-making in the tourism sector? A lot of the spa and thermal places along with small restaurants are family-owned businesses or businesses which rely on tradition. So their business and marketing strategies might be based on tradition and they might be a bit outdated. Also, those are companies that operate by default. Those are businesses that have been in place for generations or one generation. They have some ways of doing things and they have not changed them, which means that they operate by default because they don't challenge the way they operate. They are loyal to the old ways. They are loyal to the older generation which established the business. But this generation lived in a completely different environment and a completely different setting. Also, the tourism sector, it's recognized by McKinsey and company to be one of the sectors which is least responding to digital transformation and to digitalization, which means that there is some sort of resistance towards improving the business through digitalization. There is a conservative approach. We spoke to a lot of local businesses in Naples, Italy, and in Ischia. We also spoke in local businesses in Bulgaria. They always say, this won't work for me. This won't work for me might be true, but when we really challenge that assumption, it turns out that this is just a resistance to innovation and a resistance to change. At heart, the challenge is loyalty, to old ways of doing things, loyalty to tradition, which in itself is great, but it also has to consider the current situation. So what is the way forward? The way forward is what Carol Dweck calls growth mindset. A growth mindset is a way of thinking which allows us to become aware of some of our filters and some of our biases and make better decisions. On this picture, you see the difference between growth and fixed mindset. Growth mindset is about seeing things as fluid, ever-changing, and not fixed. Embracing change, embracing errors and failures, which in business is very challenging. But here we're not talking that much about failure, we are not talking about failure. We are talking about embracing new ways of thinking. And fixed mindset is thinking that things are set in stone and they are the way they are. Now, it's super simple and super logical that in an ever-changing environment, in reality which changes every day with pandemics, recessions, wars, you cannot be resistant to change because life is change. However, we see time and time again, local businesses, family businesses resisting change. This is why embracing a growth mindset is the way forward. Opening to new ideas, opening to new ways of doing things and accepting the fact that the old ways were great and they set a solid foundation, but it's time to move on and change. How do we embrace change? First, it's a great idea in the spirit of growth mindset to challenge some of our ideas, some of our conceptions, some of our ways of doing things. So these are some questions that, again, I would like you to reflect on, thinking about you and your business. Who and what are you loyal to? Are you loyal to your parents who started the business? Are you loyal to the way things are done in business? Who and what are you loyal to? What makes you sure this is the only way to do things? So how can you be so sure that the way you're doing things is the only correct way for you to do things? 
is there anyone in the industry who has done digitalization, innovation, and what are the results for them? Why would change work? Just try to flirt with this question. Why would change work? And what would make change work for you and for your business? Now, let's look at some steps to embrace change. The first step is to always acknowledge the past, celebrate the past so that it's not forgotten and so that you feel you have paid your dues to the past. You can do this through stories, which you can also use for your marketing campaign, the story of your region, the story of your cultural heritage, the story of your business, of your family. You can have a memory board in your management office or somewhere in your place, you can put a big memory board and put all the memories of the business there, pictures, articles, and it could be also a success board with past successes, which allow you to move forward and embrace change. And also you can have your special celebration days. Choose a date which is your hotel or your restaurant day, like a birthday, and make a tradition, a ritual to celebrate it. Once you have honored the past and you have made the past part of your reality, you're ready to let it go. And the second step to letting it go is, as we stated before, asking the right questions, asking open-ended questions and just being a little bit more receptive to a new answer and a new idea. Here are some ideas. How can I innovate my business? What small changes can I start making? What trainings can I take? What ritual of change can I make? And how can I celebrate change? You can celebrate the past, but you can also come up with small rituals which will help you embrace change. Like, let's go back to that example with the girl we wanted to hire, but she didn't speak English. How about making a ritual of the entire team learning 10 new words in English every day? It is change, it is new, it is learning, and it's a ritual. And last but not least, begin the learning process. Here comes our project with all its trainings. I believe this training is the introductory one to each and every training that you're going to see because all the trainings you will find on our webpage will challenge old ways and we'll be looking forward to change and innovation. But look at our videos about hotel web pages, chatbots, marketing, customer service, training and development in the sector. And of course, stay in touch. We are here for you. We'll be happy if you join us in our local event in Bulgaria in January. So stay updated by following our webpage and our blog for more news, more events, trainings, 